Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you all. Please click on the interpretation button if you would like to follow the meeting in Turkish, choose Chinese channels. And we may have Armenian questions. And if that happens, uh, you would like to choose appropriate language channel for Eastern Armenian, please choose French channel. Welcome to the first panel in a series of panels called Civil Society Sharing Screen. This is supported by the European Union, and we are gathered here to talk about the most recent developments in the civil society. We will be discussing this issue with the panelists, members of academia, and professionals from the civil society, experts, human rights activists. And please follow the social media accounts and our website for uh, more information. We would be happy to see you. Uh, and we would be very happy if you followed us up closely. We would like to start off with a question. What is your take on the rights-based approaches and service-based approaches regarding the civil society? Please share with us your answers using the chat box. Last week, we listened to a speech called Human Rights Movement, Is It in Crisis? delivered by Samuel Moyne from Yale University. Whereas today, we will be talking about main approaches in the civil society, services and advocacy. Our speakers, Elmas Aros from Zero Discrimination Association and Mahmoud Can Isal from Support to Life. And the moderation will be conducted by Hakan Ataman, a prominent figure in our sector. I want to hand it over to Hakan Bey right now. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to take a moment to thank Ranting Foundation for preparing such a wonderful series of panels for bringing all of us together in this platform. I will be moderating this meeting and I am so happy to do so. We have two speakers with us and Without further ado, I'd like to hand the microphone over to our speakers, Elmas Aruz. She has uh, been working as the president of Zero Discrimination Association since 2009. She established the association. And in 2017, an alternative school of politics was established by the association. Next speaker, Mahmoud Can Isan, uh, is a specialist in the field of refugees, a legal expert, also consultant, and for more than two years, he's been working as the legal sector manager in the Life Support to Life Association. Personally, I have also worked with this association in the field of refugees and Helsinki Citizens Association as well. So we have been in contact with uh, Mahmoud and we've had previous cooperation. I am joined by two valuable speakers in this panel. As it is indicated in the chat box, we are asked a question to start with. I'd like to remind you about that question because we would like to hear from the speakers about that question. What is your take on rights-based and service-based approaches in the civil society? What are the first things that come to your mind when it comes to rights-based and service-based approaches? We will take a look at the historic development of civil society in Turkey, in the world. Uh, what kind of a distinction we can make between these two concepts? How can we clarify and describe these two concepts? And can the two concepts coexist in uh, the civil society? We're looking forward to hearing answers for these two questions from our speakers. Should we 
expect any changes in this field in the civil society sector. And linked to this, we will be talking about advocacy and NGOs working in the field of services. We would like to talk about their policymaking processes. And when we're there, I'd like to uh, step in and share with you my experience as well when we reach that moment. And in the last part of this panel, we will talk about the disadvantaged groups and their health, accommodation, education, access to city services uh, situation. The speakers have valuable reports, publications and books in that field. And in the last part of our discussions, we would like to take a look at uh, those valuable resources. This will be the outline of the panel today. Now, I would like to turn to our speakers without causing any further delays. Let's turn to Elmas Arus. She'll be our first speaker. And then we will continue with Mahmoud Can Isad. Hakan Bay, Bay, thank you very much. I have been having a hectic and busy day since the morning. And we came together with my colleagues and thought about rights-based and service-based civil society activities. And I want to share with you our take on this. In our association, Zero Discrimination Association, we ponder a lot on this. Actually, we have to do so. Since 2009, on behalf of our association, I should say, we concentrate on vulnerable groups and their access to rights, especially Roma people. We worked on advocacy, lobbying activities, and many other works that require policy changes, workshop organizations and meetings. We've been doing that. And in the past two years, actually in the past year only, since the outset of the pandemic, I should say, because we're working on a community-based level, we haven't been able to see the results in the field because things have changed significantly due to the pandemic. We're working with the vulnerable groups, Roma people, from the west to east, anywhere in Turkey, most people lost their jobs due to the pandemic and they're having difficulty. The concept, the rights-based activities concept was already new and the pandemic made things even worse. What should we do in this process to improve the things, to empower those vulnerable groups and to meet their needs? What can be done about this? Well, we had quite a challenging strategy. We didn't have a services-based framework. We were trying to set it up with a rights-based approach with public outreach. This concerns fundamental nutrition needs, clothing, ele paying electricity bills, utility bills, supporting families in that re regard. So this covers many aspects. We decided to do the following. Our uh, solution was as follows. In order to support those people, we tried to turn a service-based approach to a rights-based approach. And we thought we must enter into cooperation with the right stakeholders like district governor's offices, municipalities, other NGOs, and other stakeholders. We decided to set up such a framework, for example, what those individuals are going to do if they lose their electricity service or natural gas service in their houses. They need to write a petition. Where should they apply? How about their transportation cost? They have to take a bus, they have to buy a meal for themselves for lunch. They may need uh, 
health services, they may have to see a doctor, they may have a health problem. How are they going to cope with that? Will they be provided with necessary support? How about technical support? So we thought about all those aspects on the one hand. On the other hand, I should say we work in 34 locations. We have field teams in 34 locations. We have a focal uh, contact persons located in the relevant neighborhoods. They were already a part of the local community and our contact people were aware of the needs in that neighborhood. And they already had an idea about a solution for those people. I'm talking about participation. On the one hand, we're trying to improve a participatory process on a rights-based approach. And in our association, we're trying to give them a framework, if you like. On the other hand, because we're trying to work on a rights-based approach, we know this is not just about referral. Yes, it, is, it involves referring people to relevant services, but especially in the East and Southeast, many families do not have hygienic accommodation means or a healthy life. They need a healthy life. And for that, they need to write a petition to the municipality, district governor's office. The two institutions should be collaborating with each other. So relevant institutions need to be mobilized and this should have a legislative framework. So by means of advocacy, we try to activate and organize this process. We, must, we want to make sure those people have access to fundamental rights. We try to do that and we try to create, create concrete results for those people thanks to this mechanism. With respect to resources and infrastructure, we were quite strained, to be honest. It was quite challenging. If you wonder why, here is the answer. Based on the feedback we get from the field, we understood this uh, group of people, those uh, vulnerable people, have difficulty accessing food. The problem was so severe. Access to health services, access to food and accommodation, these are serious problems. And we'll come to the following conclusion. We talk about people who lost their food, who lost their job, who lost their access to education, who have very bad accommodation services. These people are discriminated people. Only rights-based approach will not be sufficient for those people. They absolutely need services-based approach combined with the rights-based approach. We need a combination of the two approaches. This is very obvious, especially when it concerns our target group. I have a lot of examples from the field. We have a lot of experience in the field, like Tepejik, a neighborhood, a Roma neighborhood in Izmir. We worked there and large police vehicles entered the neighborhood and electricity, electricity meters were dismantled by the officials because those families households were not able to pay for the electricity bill. This is just an example. Out of goodwill, we tried to, uh, the idea of course is not to chip in and pay the, for their electricity bills, but the approach is all those people have a right to have access to electricity. And in that matter, we made good use of media and those uh, people are given access to electricity. At the moment, around 100 households now have access to electricity again, thanks to these activities. 
we evaluate the data we have, we get feedback from the field. That's how we try to design the services. Yes, this is about philanthropy and charity activities, but it is important to make sure the efforts are well targeted. We have a long way to go. Along the way, we revisit many policies and practices, and we will learn a lot from the experiences that are shared on this platform. Thank you very much. I'd like to wrap up. So we will start it from the last question. Uh, well, they're all interrelated, but the pandemic aggravated already existing problems and the workload is even heavier than before. And when we think of your answer, we conclude that advocacy in and by itself is not enough and it has to be supported with service delivery. There has to be a combination of the two. Of course, it's not quite easy to achieve this. And you already face some challenges trying to do that. And you shared with us in what ways you have been able to overcome the challenges. Thank you very much for this valuable uh, speech. Now, I would like to turn to Mahmoud Chan Isal from Support to Life Association. And just uh, one more reminder to our participants. Please make sure you type your questions in the chat box. We will try to answer all of your questions after the speeches. And if you are willing, uh, toward the end, you'll be able to uh, turn on your microphones and ask questions as well. Hakan Bey, thank you. I'd like to thank Elmas Hanum for her valuable speech. It is a great opportunity for us to learn from other colleagues' experiences, and I truly enjoyed listening to the previous speaker's speech. Here, I represent Support to Life Association. Ours is a services-based association. And this association mainly works for response to disasters. And we uh, try to combine the two approaches in our association. Civil society lies in the core of a democratic life. As Ban Ki-moon said, Civil society means more democracy, more participation, and more transparency and openness. And we truly believe in that. We would like to make sure uh, all of us participate more in democratic life. Rights-based approach is a sine qua non, but when it comes to the results, I should say we are an operational association, a services-based organization. We concentrate on the needs. Of course, we identify the needs on a rights-based approach. We are using a combination. And this brings me to the third question. We try to identify the needs. And I'd like to tell you more about that later, but for now, as I said, it's not random, but it's based on the needs that we deliver the service to the target groups. It is possible to combine rights and services based approaches. I should say, I can't consider civil society service where you make a total distinction or separation between the two approaches. On the contrary, there has to be a combination. The two concepts should coexist. At the moment, we work in eight provinces. We also work in Zonguldak. So we cover eight, nine provinces. We organize events on special occasions in order to increase visibility. Uh, 
IATA Destek Association, we believe that warfare is a disaster as well. Disasters can be man-made or they can be natural. And um, at the time of disasters or catastrophes, um, we need to uh, provide this to um, people. And a war is a man-made uh, catastrophe. And in Turkey right now, we have more than 4 million um, refugees. And as such, um, as Hayata Destek Association, we bring rights-based uh, humanitarian aid to these people. And yet another thing that we do is um, seasonal workers in agriculture. Now, um, people have to live in tents and people um, need to sort of uh, move from one place to another. And families have to go from one city to another. They start in Urfa, go to Adana, Malatya, and then back to Urfa. And most uh, vulnerable groups here are mainly children, and we um, reach out to them. And Rights-based humanitarian aid is something um, that is the principle for us. And I'd like to quote Sema Genel. Um, and and dignity, human dignity and humanitarian aid, uh, how they should uh, go hand in hand and how we should perhaps marry the two. Um, this is our motto as the um, association and how do we do that a dignified life and how do we provide humanitarian aid that's in line with uh, integrity and um, we do not compromise on our principles as Hayata Destek Association what are our principles when we provide humanitarian aid independence impartiality being non-discriminatory and accountability are all uh, key and um, this is something that makes us very proud as well and something that we never compromise on and um, and when we do that, humanitarian aid is rights-based. So um, what is the origin of these um, principles? And uh, these are not things that we um, came up with as Hayata Destek Association, International Red Crescent and Red Cross um, in cases of uh, humanitarian aid um, and they have these guidelines uh, that civil society organizations need to adhere to. They have a code of uh, conduct, IFRC, for instance, for um, NGOs in disaster relief. And also they, they have these uh, severe standards that originated in 1997. And these are fundamental humanitarian aid standards. And we uh, take these very seriously. And when we look at humanitarian aid, we see a rights-based um, approach protection, which is an indispensable, inseparable part uh, of all of this. And it's at the heart of um, all of these things. So in a way, um, I, as an employee, um, I also believe that um, humanitarian aid needs to have protection component in it, uh, psychological support, uh, case management, and, um, and these are important parts of humanitarian aid. Humanitarian aid is not just providing hygiene kits uh, to people, but um, it's about empowering people as well. And it's about, in a way, um, helping them stand on their two feet. Um, so this is what this encompasses. And um, just like every NGO, um, we also, our raison d'etre is to actually um, make ourselves uh, unnecessary or irrelevant. So uh, having this uh, rights-based approach is of paramount importance. And being community-based is also very important. Um, once we empower people, uh, there should be no need for us to be there anymore. So rights-based approach is so important when you identify needs and bring aid to people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahmoud Bey.
Now, advocacy and NGO policies, um, there are two um, starting points uh, that we have heard about. And um, rights based advocacy, rights advocacy is one side to this coin. And um, um, you indicated that in humanitarian aid, it is um, so important uh, to um, bring a rights advocacy. So these two actually are intertwined and they complement one another, um, rendering services and uh, rights advocacy. Now, uh, El Mosanum um, talked about um, being inclusive and participatory and um, pluralistic uh, when services are rendered. Uh, participation of the uh, target audience is important, she said. And you talked about accountability and empowering people. And you also um, talked about uh, not being discriminatory when services are rendered. And um, I think this is so important. Uh, and um, zero, um, for instance, zero um, discrimination is one of your mottos. So as a civil society organization, this is something that you take very seriously. I don't think there's anything that I'd like to add to this. Maybe a rule of law, um, that's also very important. In international uh, human rights, uh, rule of law, in all of these human rights uh, documents, you see a reference to uh, rule of law and how human rights uh, and fundamental freedoms must be upheld. And what you have added uh, is the EU and the UN and the Council of Europe in many of their documents, they uh, mention um, being rights-based and um, there are certain responses that they give to that question, rule of law, empowerment, uh, being participatory and um, trans and not being discriminatory. Uh, these are all things that um, are important and these are all things that need to be implemented when we um, talk about these matters. Now, by and large, I believe that a rights-based approach or rights advocacy and service advocacy, um, uh, or, or in terms of rendering services, once you adhere to these principles, I don't think there's a major difference between them, uh, whether you render services or whether you advocate uh, for something, um, if you base yourselves on these uh, principles, then what you do is rights-based and um, in line, in compliance with rights advocacy. However, I also have perhaps uh, a further question for you. Um, one more thing that I'd like to bring to your attention. For quite some time, human rights, uh, regarding human rights policies, uh, human rights uh, council, um, uh, was established by esteemed human rights um, advocates, but in 2012, it uh, confiscated itself. Up until that that, that time, they uh, came up with many instruments and um, service and rights-based advocacy issues were discussed in great detail. And um, what kind of a problem is there um, is what they discussed. Um, the impact on NGOs, what NGOs think, uh, rights advocates, advocates think, they have been, um, they, they were um, actually um, engaged in, in a survey about that. And um, they talked about a particular moment. Now, once you start uh, engaging in rights uh, advocacy, uh, you don't get the fruits of your efforts uh, overnight. I mean, you, you reap the fruits of your efforts um, after decades have passed, or maybe sometimes centuries, you can't predict what the outcome will be in a, in a couple of years. And, um, you know, let's uh, think of the women's liberation uh, movement. It's a pertinent topic right now. Uh, what with the um, discussions about Istanbul Convention and the overturning of um, uh, Istanbul Convention in Turkey. But for hundreds of years, women uh, struggled for their rights. And, um, and they were met with um, harsh backlash, but um, still 
uh, this struggle for equality um, persists and there is still um, backlash but um, but when we um, talk about services like women's employment and so on and so forth, micro grants or other sorts of uh, interventions, how to bolster women's entrepreneurship um, in a matter of years, perhaps you can you can see the uh, results of your efforts. But um, Human Rights uh, Council um, brought attention to this. I mean, um, these. How can we um, keep on working in the absence of quick returns? And how do you um, bring different stakeholders together? Sometimes there's tension between different stakeholders. And in the field of human rights advocacy, this is something that pisses people off. I mean, women uh, were engaged in the struggle in Turkey for such a long time, but overnight, the president um, uh, pulled Turkey out of the Istanbul Convention. And that was that. So. Um, rather than uh, rendering services, or even if you render services, um, when you focus on rights and rights only, uh, it, things take time. And uh, service should be rendered in a rights-based approach. And when you do that, uh, things are seen much more easily. Elmas Sanam also talked about um, certain interesting things and, uh, and how they achieved certain um, positive results. Um, you know, the um, Hayata Destek Association, they also have some examples, most probably, uh, analyzing needs and then directly um, targeting um, the beneficiaries and making sure that these services are targeted to the beneficiaries. And if you do that, perhaps you uh, receive the results or see the results much more quickly. But when it comes to seasonal work in agriculture, for instance, um, things might be uh, much trickier, perhaps. You might have to eradicate the reasons why people uh, end up working in um, such precarious work. So, um, so perhaps, we need to adopt this lens and um, um, between rights advocacy and rendering services and the link between the two, what are the challenges that you encounter or what is it that you do to overcome the challenges that you encounter? Perhaps we, we can uh, hear from you about these topics. Let us begin with Elmas Hanım again. Thank you so much once again. Now, actually, Most of the time, we base ourselves on the field, on the needs of the people. We change our needs, uh, our methods of working. And um, last year, um, on the 8th of um, April, World um, Day, uh, Roma Day, we initiated a campaign to support the Roma um, to facilitate their access to basic food items and to compensate for their work of in loss of income and to cater to uh, their needs, we initiated an awareness campaign at the time. And we asked uh, people to tell us um, what they're going through, to shoot some videos and share them with us. And all of them actually shared videos uh, from um, you know, people in Urfa, musicians in Urfa, paper collectors in Istanbul. And uh, we shared. Um, a video uh, online to draw attention to the plight of um, the Roma. And the video that we shared under the video, um, um, someone from the ministry um, uh, wrote something uh, defamatory. And uh, this was shared for about 30,000 times and people uh, criticized that so harshly. and. Um, and that person was taken, uh, were demoted. Uh, we didn't expect that to happen, but it was uh, a direct outcome of what we did. Al albeit uh, it was an, albeit an unintended outcome. So access to uh, basic food items, um, you know, how to reach out to, to people who do not have that basic access. We need a policy change, obviously, and uh, even this very small campaign 
uh, start got people talking about that. And when it comes to agricultural work, um, we work, with, you know, Hayata Destek also works on this at the same time in Adana, in um, 80,000 uh, people were going to uh, Konya, from Adana to Konya. To, so we wanted to depict uh, what they went through. On the way, uh, we um, initiated some uh, campaigns uh, to draw attention to uh, what they are going through. Um, so this is what we have been doing. So it's important to strategize when and as things happen. Because things change so fast, uh, things in the lives of people we work with change so fast, and you need to strategize accordingly. And sometimes, um, it's it's a mother um, that you need to reach out to, and sometimes it's a mayor, and so on and so forth. So there isn't one single uh, method because there isn't one single problem. There are tens of different problems. And you need to be present in tens of different places, and you need to devise uh, different methodologies uh, to tackle these issues. And you need to uh, think about that, and you need to keep an eye on things, and you need to be in touch with people on the ground. You should never, ever forego these relations. Um, you need to always uh, forge these ties, because people, at the time of the pandemic, people um, cannot visit their neighbors, but these people, by using their mobile phones, they they were giving us news. And in these neighborhoods, you don't have social workers. And we're talking about marginalized um, neighbors. Uh, the state, um, the government offers no help to them. Civil society organizations are not present there. And um, the civil society is not there at all. So through these people, only through these people can we strategize and decide what needs to be done and we still continue with this method in 34 different fields we have 34 contact people and you're definitely in touch with these people and um and that's um that's how we strategize it's imperative that we hear from the people on the ground this is what we base our advocacy work on and also one more thing that's really important. We talked about the importance of transparency and accountability and so on and so forth. And um, inclusiveness is equally as important when we talk about um, rights, a rights-based approach, especially when it comes to vulnerable um, people, vulnerable um, individuals. For instance, let's just say the municipality or the district governor's office has certain conditions. Uh, one of those conditions is to uh, not have, uh, have a house uh, to your name. A, a Roman family, Roma family, they own uh, a scrap of a car and they can't get that benefit. Or they um, have a house, but they don't even have the title deed for that house. But, um, you know, um, and still they're denied aid. So, so we receive um, all of these um, complaints. And that's why it's so important to strategize and it's so important to uh, continue this advocacy on the ground. Thank you very much. You talked about the importance of being on the ground and inclusiveness as well. That's another important dimension of what we're discussing here today, I believe. Now, let us continue with you, Mahmoud, and then uh, we will get back to you once again. Thank you very much. Elmas's uh, interventions have been very um, enlightening. Thank you very much. Um, now, I uh, would like to talk about our association, Hayata Destek, Support Life, but regarding the example you gave, uh, Hakambe, you need to exercise patience when it comes to rights advocacy. I'd like to give you an example about the refugees. As a legist, this is something that I know really well. And um, regarding foreigners in Turkey, um, um, you know, we have um, an international protection law that dates back to 2014, so it's quite new. And this was after the um, influx of the refugees. And, um, um, 
we have a heritage of rights advocacy in Turkey, even before the Syrian crisis. The um, Court of Human Rights has many uh, rulings or um, rulings of uh, violation, and um, the Jabari ruling that dates back to year 2000, uh, Turkey making um, asylum application impossible. And there were many other interim decisions. In 2009, Karina et al. ruling, um, European Court of Human Rights warned Turkey and said, um, you know, come up with a regulation, otherwise, um, you, know, uh, you know, there will be more violation and rulings. And then that's how Turkey started to work on this. Um, the Jabali ruling is from year 2000, but we go way before that. And many of our um, colleagues, Abdur Rahim Yilmaz, um, he was quite instrumental in, in this struggle within the European Court of Human Rights. In 2014, we uh, had um, a legislation. In 2016, it was impeded because of a decree. Um, but things take time. We need to be patient. And, um, you know, um, we need to use uh, creative methods. Uh, that is so very important as well. And uh, sometimes you get a ruling from the European Court of Human Rights and for your advocacy work, uh, that is very important. And then sometimes uh, from the ombudsmanship, you uh, get a recommendation and that changes many things. Another example uh, from the ombudsman, um, I listened to this uh, at a panel regarding access to education, a refugee child in Ankara in the capital. Uh, 200 complaints um, were received um, by a non-governmental organization and uh, it was sent to the ombudsman's office and the ombudsman visited the school, uh, the chief ombudsman, uh, who is a lawyer, visited the school and enabled access to education for that, uh, for those um, children. But there were 200 applications to that effect. And um, that's why it's so important to employ different methods and, and um, you know, in advocacy, this is key. This is like a general perspective that I wanted to share with you, making use of um, creative methods. That's something that we should always bear in mind. And policymaking, when it comes to policymaking, of course, uh, as Hayata Destek Association, uh, when we set our policies, uh, we look at needs, we adopt a needs-based approach. It's not like we um, devise our policies and then knock on the doors of refugees or other disadvantaged uh, groups. What we do is we assess their needs. Uh, we look at the disaster, the overarching needs. We try to ascertain that first and based on that, do we um, strategize um, long-term. And when it comes to advocacy, uh, as uh, Hayata Destek Association, what do we do and um, what is it that we do or what are the difficulties we uh, encounter? Let me tell you about that now. Now, we try to do uh, with the media as much as possible, alternative media or mainstream media, and um, we try to reach out to um, both uh, outlets um, and uh, we inform them about refugees, what they're going through, and we make sure that they um, feature um, correct information in their news stories. We try to share with everyone um, um, what, what we know. And in terms of creating content, we try to support many different organizations. And we also have um, specialists, our director, Sema Genel, for two years, she has been um, working in this uh, area in many different echelons. Our managers, our social workers, uh, our psychologists are working and our lawyers are working and supporting us. And um, we also benefit from their expertise as much as possible. And we create reports as well. And apart from that, um, our communication team frequently has asked questions is something that we do regarding um, refugees, uh, for instance, that and we, uh, we um, explain some misconceptions. I mean, and actually, we have worked with Granting um, um, Foundation some on this previously. Like refugees are subjected to hate speech in the media, and this is based on bogus news, fake news. For example, a fake credit card produced 
by some people and more than one bank's logo is printed on that credit card. And they use Photoshop app to claim it is funded by the taxpayers in Turkey and our communication team is trying to counter such fake uh, content. We run our own social media campaigns as well concerning the refugees and child labor in seasonal labor. We have a campaign, uh, a very old campaign and the campaign is called, it's not just like a child's game. This is the name of the campaign that has been running for quite a long time. We have been able to reach out to so many people in the community, in the civil society. We work with valuable experts in the field of child protection. The content is valuable there. This is a very important campaign. Other than that, we have capacity building activities. Under that title, we're trying to empower the local teams, civil society organizations at local level, public institutions at local level, for example, Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality or Migration uh, Management General Directorates, local uh, offices, provincial uh, offices of the family ministry of family bar associations they are all a part of our capacity building activities we provide psychological support case management refugee law child protection and the legal aspects of this field so we're trying to build capacity in those fields and we also uh, monitor the results we enter into good cooperation thanks to capacity building and we have been able to improve access to rights and services. We see very concrete results. On to my next point. I can also talk about disasters. We have a special communication perspective regarding disasters. In 2020, just before the outbreak of the pandemic, we survived two disasters in Turkey. An earthquake in Elize hit Turkey. We are not specialized in earthquakes, but we still have quite some experience in that area. And seeing the need in the field and us having the experience in response to earthquakes, just uh, one morning later, one morning after the earthquake, we reached out to the heads of the neighborhoods in the site. We communicated with all of them. We followed our communication procedure to uh, respond to the disaster in the field. It's called first response. That's what we did. We were there in person over the telephone calls, and we have done that in line with global standards. We identify the needs and we communicate with the institutions who are supposed to answer those needs. Sometimes it's us who is supposed to answer the needs. Sometimes it's another institution. For example, if it's about accommodation, we communicate with that author authority who's going to provide accommodation to the survivors. That's how we determine our policies and we encounter significant challenges in doing that. That's the case for many NGOs. Of course, we don't have uh, a sanction power. We don't have any binding uh, decisions on anyone, but we still publish reports. Turkstat shared data with us in September 2020. That's the latest we have in our hands. Normally, uh, this kind of data is supposed to be updated every four years. Unfortunately, in reality, it is updated every eight years because we haven't received any update in 2016 when it comes to 
for example, the number of children engaged in seasonal agricultural work, we didn't have any updates. We work on a project basis in delivering services. This means some difficulties. Another challenge is we don't have a fixed budget. It's all uh, relying on the projects we have. And this is posing a challenge. Sometimes this hampers some support that we would normally be able to give out, but because of an unstable budget, sometimes we're not able to provide that support. And we have to abide by accountability, on the other hand. Sometimes these principles make the life a little bit more difficult. So we do have those challenges in the field. Another uh, difficulty has to do with prejudice. The other day, I was attending a panel in a university. The university students were the listeners. I was sharing concrete data with the students, and one student stood up and told me I was lying. And I said, no, not all Syrians were given citizenship, and this is a fact, and this is data. It's not that I'm lying. It was just data I was uh, sharing with them. So that's where I saw a prejudice against refugees. On another occasion, I was talking about child labor and one of the listeners stood up and said, what is wrong with child labor? It's good. It gives them responsibility. When we were children, we were also made to work. So as a uh, humanitarian aid a NGO worker, you have to keep calm and uh, explain it in a calm way to the listeners. Make and make sure they understand what is wrong with child labor. So we do our best. We try to communicate all the data and the facts. We're trying to build capacity. By the way, we also face a risk of politicization in the fields of work. I mean, I'm talking about politics. Some politicians, unfortunately, share fake news in the social media. You should be aware of this. And these are big lies, like Syrians can enter university with no entry exam. This is not true. Or some other fake news, like all Syrians will be given a job. No, that's not true. And I would like to thank Ibrahim uh, because she shared our campaign in the chat box. Please check that out too. We develop some scenarios. For example, one scenario concerns your city being bombed and asking you what you would do. Would you evacuate? Would you stay? So there are such uh, scenarios that are there to raise awareness. Ibrahim, thank you so much for sharing that in the chat box. We also have advocacy works. We're trying to build capacity in that area, and we uh, get good results out of that. We see a higher quality in the services delivered by the public authorities, and on, on many occasions, we have been able to overcome prejudices. For example, female labor force. In Yeshili district of Mardin, we supported a cooperative called Kekik. This cooperative was established in Mardin. Thanks to our support, Turkish women work with refugee women. They produce together. They work together in this cooperative. In this system, they are all together. And we, our volunteers are there. And we're trying to reach out to more people. We're just trying to support social cohesion as well, and that's very important to overcome prejudices. This is also a part of our advocacy work. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have shared with us the challenges you have encountered. And you touched upon uh, two questions that we asked under normal circumstances. rights advocacy work is being done in a broader field. In a modern world, it's the 
state who may be doing the violation. So it is uh, top to bottom. And that's in that direction that you get the reaction. And we see it's broader. And non-state actors are in play in hate speech, in hate crimes, in discrimination. Sometimes uh, citizen to citizen problems emerge, unfortunately, like child labor, child rights violations. Of course, child labor is banned by international conventions. Discrimination is banned by our constitution, by international conventions, but we still see that happening, unfortunately. And everyone is aware of this, the public institutions, the laymen on the street, everyone is aware of that these days. Ibrahim is sharing more content in the chat box. And as far as I see, there is a question that I would like to read out to you. Please make sure you type your questions or raise your hand and ask for the microphone. Here is the question from a participant. How can you remain motivated do you ever lose your motivation? That happens to me a lot, but this question is asked to you. Which one of us, me or Mahmoud? Elma Sandem, go ahead, please. Well, we're talking about the pandemic. And to be honest, for the first time, I've been feeling I start to lose my motivation. I felt like, I felt deprivation, impossibilities. Public institutions, it looked as if they were shocked, paralyzed, and they couldn't reach out to the target groups, vulnerable groups. Let's take a simple example in Tekirda, in one of the districts there. This a neighborhood with 350 houses uh, contracted the disease, COVID, and most of the households had the disease and there is an urgent need for food, accommodation, whereas the municipality service is not that agile. The district governor's office cannot act in, a su in such an agile way, but people are waiting there hungry without a roof uh, on top of their heads. There has to be an urgent uh, response. In Tekirda, there are local organizations. We have close cooperation with them. And this was an advantage of ours, especially access to basic food was a big problem. And when that happened, we felt um, we, we felt we were losing our motivation, to be honest. It was not easy. We talk about social discrimination and it was a stark uh, example of that kind of a discrimination. Such people, they're vulnerable, they're poor, severe poverty, serious problems regarding access to food, and women and children are subjected to domestic violence. And we try to make sure each and every application that they made to us received an answer. But this is not sustainable given the limited resources we have. It's not sustainable. In the midst of that, we had to take a decision. We set up a solidarity network for the Roma people. We set it up in that spirit. That was helpful to uh, provide clothing for those people, food for those people, or repair works for those people if they had a leaky roof. That provided the motivation 
but that was not a sustainable way because we talk about the big poverty problem. At the moment, as much as possible, given our limited resources, we do our best to intervene in many, in as many places as possible, but it's not sustainable. Some children dropped out of school. They have to have access to education. Uh, women are subject to the violence. They have to be protected against violence. And uh, cleaning services, hygienic services, they have to be ensured on a sustainable basis. Otherwise, the vulnerability will eventually turn into anger and people will eventually give up, I'm afraid, but we don't want that to happen. Sometimes we do feel hopeless that happened to us. It's not just us. Uh, our sister and brother organizations also sometimes feel hopeless and sometimes they lose their motivation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud Bey, how about you? Thank you very much. I agree with my colleague. Well, sometimes uh, we do feel uh, exasperated, but yes, we do feel hopeless sometimes because it's as if you keep on banging into the same wall again and again. The problem remains to be the same. The solution is a simple one, but you can't do it. It's as if the teacher is asking you, uh, what is two by two? You know the answer is four, but you just cannot say it. You just keep on banging on, hitting and crashing into the same wall again and again. So how do I keep my motivation high? Well, I work for disadvantaged people. And I, I live in Istanbul. And there are 1 million refugees in Istanbul. Istanbul, such a big city. And 1 million people somehow survived. They uh, fled war in their country. They decided to come to Istanbul, the most difficult city in Turkey to live in. And they survived. They're resilient. They're powerful people. And you have to keep it in mind. These people are powerful people. And you're trying to, we are trying to support those people so they have access to their rights. We're trying to act as a bridge between those rights and those people. At the moment, they are vulnerable, but we don't pity them. On the contrary, we respect them and we see their strengths. We're trying to help them strengthen. Uh, their powerful sides. When we encounter such cases in our association, what we do is we highlight the strengths of those individuals. That gives them a motivation, hope, strength, and that helps uh, a lot with communication. If you were in the shoes of those refugees, would you like to be pitied? Of course not. On the contrary, uh, refugees want to have a different communication with you. And this is a great motivation for me because you have great people to work with. Those people are having difficulty, but they are very powerful. And it's a great pleasure to support them. Maybe they have a certain disadvantage at the moment and I'm trying to help them because I'm not suffering from that disadvantage. I am a white Sunni heterosexual male in Turkey and I am enjoying a luxury in Turkey. That's what I'm trying to say. And of course, I should be helping those people out who may not... Uh, be able to enjoy these privileges. So I have that motivation. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing with us your motivation and your ways of overcoming uh, those difficult times when you lose your motivation. There is one more question here in the chat box. When it concerns rights-based work and accountability, what are the challenges encountered concerning the structuring of the civil society? I think this question will go to Mahmoud Bey, uh, but maybe after Mahmoud Bey, Elmas Hanum may want to step into. Yes. Thank you. My master Seda Hanum asked that question. It's easy to bring the two concepts together, rights-based work and accountability. Everything is uh, centered around a decent work. Of course, it is possible to provide the element of accountability in everything we do, because whatever we do, the reasons are clear, the expected results are clear, and of course we can be accountable before the eyes of the public opinion, ombudsman people, or fund providers. So we are confident in what we do. We can be accountable. We are doing everything we do for the rights of those deprived people. It is possible. That's my answer to the question. Because I work for Support to Life Association. I, I'm I, Humbly, I should say, we would be proud to go through a scrutiny. For example, we can hold ourselves accountable in everything we do, in every step we take. And we respect a decent life principle and fundamental rights, access to fundamental rights and international humanitarian aid. We are uh, led by those principles in everything we do. Was that an answer to the question? I'm, I hope that was an answer. Elma Sanum, would you like to interject at this point? Well, in humanitarian aid field, it's not very difficult to be accountable. We can be accountable, but that's not the problem. Where we're having the problem is whether it's rights-based approach or the other approach, you're trying to convey support to needy people. And we are expected to show a concrete result in what we do. And whatever we do, we have to abide by the legislation. And my colleague talked about the rights, access to services or referral to different services. Considering my target group, sometimes when you refer the applicants to other departments, it could be misunderstood. The applicant may think we're being neglectful or we're not caring enough, but actually that's not the case because we talk about aid, humanitarian aid. Those needy people want to see something concrete in their hands. They want to see a concrete aid in their hands. There is a fine line in between, and you need to discern between the two. Well, this is also a challenge for us. Thank you very much. We expect to get more questions. Feel free to raise your hand and ask your question. I'd like to say, uh, thinking of a conference I was attending the other day, I would like to ask you a question about 
rights advocacy, service delivery, and the connection in between. Here's my question. In the economic and social rights field, how do you see the situation? You are engaged in a struggle here for these people. And your personal rights sometimes may be merging with economic and social rights. Do you see such a merger? And how do you uh, see that situation? And quite linked with that, my other question is the following. You shared with us the challenges you encounter. Sometimes people come and offer you their support and services. Other NGOs, do they come and offer their support to you? How about government agencies? Do they come to you and say they want to be of help to you? Other organizations, other uh, departments, uh, are they supportive? Elma Sanam, we can start with you. Let me start with the second question. In the past two years, the public agencies, other NGOs are very willing to cooperate with us because we work in a difficult area and this requires cooperation. And they are all trying to develop a strategy. For example, the government has a strategy and action plan for Roma people, and the opposition parties have a strategy for Roma people. And there is a need for cooperation. And we do receive many requests for cooperation. economic, social, cultural rights. Mainly on these rights, we receive lots of requests for cooperation. For example, access to labor market, access to job. For example, April 8 is the World Roma People Day or some musical festivals, special occasions. In that respect, especially in the municipalities, in our work, with municipalities, our work with the Council of Europe. We do that cooperation. By the way, I am acting as the Turkey coordinator of the Roma program run by the Council of Europe. And we do have that cooperation. The community should be together with the municipality. They should decide together, come up with solutions together. And whatever we do, it should be based on data. Strategy should be decided based on data. Yes, we receive large numbers of requests from municipalities. It's not just about zero discrimination. It's also about the program run by the Council of Europe. At the moment, we work with five municipalities with, as pilots. The number will go up to 10, 10 pilot municipalities. This shows us the importance of cooperation. Because when you cooperate, you can ach achieve uh, change quickly, especially in our field. Change cannot be achieved with the existence of civil society alone or local government alone. There should be cooperation at local level. That's how we can make change. And it should be shaped by the needs of the society. in a zero discrimination association. In the past two years, we concentrate on economy, access to labor market and fighting against poverty. 
because as we speak now, these are the most serious problems, especially 90% of our target group are severely poor. We have to break uh, that cycle. Otherwise, we can't talk about access to education, access to accommodation, or fighting against discrimination. So that's why sustainability and access to employment is so important. That's why we are focusing on this so much. And um, in addition to that, in our fight against discrimination, um, we also focus on this. And throughout all of these processes, we take a very serious cooperation with local authorities. Thank you. Like Elmas has said, I would like to talk about um, cooperation. We cooperate with many different stakeholders in many different areas. And just to give you an example, we take very seriously um, our work in Viran Shehir, and uh, we have this committee that fight, uh, fights against child labor. We work together with the direct um, governor's uh, office or the district governor's office. And in Shanlurfa as well, we um, established uh, a community center with the municipality. We um, brought our expertise and the municipality mobilized their resources and this community center was opened as a result. And like I said previously, um, we also offer trainings. And uh, with the Bar Association of Mardin, we completed a three-month training course, uh, law um, on refugees, psychological counseling, women's human rights, and so on and so forth. And also we cooperate with other NGOs and uh, we cooperate with Stop Femicides platform. And I will talk about that soon. As well, uh, we have um, a call center, and some of these corporations um, are initiatives where we uh, knock on the doors of other uh, NGOs, or sometimes it's the other way around. Of course, we always um, adhere to our principles. We had a joint project with Hunting Foundation, um, Ekin was the um, contact person for that project from the Granting Foundation. So we, as Hayata Destek Foundation, um, have been a part of such projects. We train municipalities, and also what we do is um, social um, work centers. We supervise them and so on and so forth. Coming back to your uh, next question, um, is it economic and social, um, our support, and actually, there's a duality in this. And um, as Hayata Destek Association, we offer economic and social um, support. We try to empower people. And on the other hand, what we also do is we offer case management, psychological counseling, and legal counseling, and protection services as well. And as such, uh, we support people and if a Syrian refugee comes to Turkey without any documents, identification, we also support them so that they can, they can um, solve their problems. And also, uh, in terms of access to public aid and humanitarian aid, we also offer them help. And with people who have the risk of being extradited and who, do, who should not be extradited, we also offer them help. So these are, uh, the, this is the range of our activities and it's quite a wide range as you would appreciate. Now, finally, anything you'd like to add? Let me ask you, give you the final words and also ask our participants and remind them uh, that they can ask their questions by raising their hands if they'd like to ask a question or make an additional comment. But they can also type in their questions through the chat box. So, yes. 
First of all, we'd like to thank you very much for this detailed account. You've given us some highlights about the tactics that you utilize and some challenges that you encounter. And also, your cooperations, anything that you would like to add, any final words from your side? Anything that you want to add? Here's what I want to say. Service-based and rights-based um, NGOs, uh, they must cooperate. This is of paramount importance. Perhaps we should compound this cooperation, find means and ways to uh, further strengthen this cooperation. Maybe devise new strategies because, on the one hand, uh, rights-based, you know, organizations that work uh, in a rights-based and um, service-based approach should obviously preserve their terms, but we should definitely strengthen cooperation. That's very important. Thank you. Likewise, I would like to thank Elmas and you and Hranting Foundation. Um, one of the, yes, we've talked about negative impacts of the pandemic, but um, there are some advantages, some novelties as well that it introduced into our lives. And as Hayata Destek Foundation, uh, we are now in a process of digitalization. Of course, the disadvantaged people that we are working with have some problems in terms of digitalization, but as Hayata Destek Foundation, we did our best to adapt to remote work. And um, that's why we actually, in April of last year, we activated, operationalized a new um, uh, channel in eight different fields, uh, in, you know, from eight provinces to 81 provinces. Now people can call us up and get information as to how they can have access to our services. So um, now we are present, very much present in 81 provinces, and we have this website that we published in Turkish, Kurdish, Arabic, and Persian very soon will become available. Uh, right now, Turkish, Kurdish, and Arabic are uh, already available. And also, uh, we have a website. Um, in the past, we would um, present this content in physical form to our beneficiaries, but now, in a visual and digital manner, everything is available online. Videos, voice recordings, brochures, all these different uh, texts, Hayata Destek, um, online com, available in Arabic and Turkish and Kurdish, and hopefully we will increase the number of our languages soon. And, you know, we used to travel a lot, and all across the world, I'm sure it's the same, uh, UNHCR uh, specialist Jeb Prispet um, on social media voiced his concerns. Um, as social um, um, specialists, we used to travel a lot by plane, and I personally, um, I would spend uh, eight, five days a year flying from one point to another, and our carbon footprint was reduced uh, after the pandemic hit. So, in a way, um, a new world is emerging, a greener uh, way of working is emerging thanks to digitalization and also our um, clients uh, are still being supported on the field. We still have people who are working um, really hard and um, they continue to support our clients, but um, things are getting more and more digitalized um, for us and for our beneficiaries as well. We are doing our best to transform ourselves so that our services remain available to all. So basically, this is what I wanted to say as my final words. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you very much for, for, for this um, event, for this talk. Um, there are so many participants. We'd like to thank them once again for their participation. One last thing, Hakan Bey. And just to make an addition to Seda Hanım's question, Seda Hanım saying that, she said, that's not what I mean. There are mechanisms um, 
to hold state authorities accountable, but when it's the civil society, can they really be held accountable? Now I understand the question better. Thank you. Yes, uh, you know, obviously we care about accountability and um, and um, the services um, that we provide are of paramount importance and at the beginning of the panel uh, i said that civil society for democracy is at the heart of of democracy and um bank to quote ban ki-moon the more participation means uh, more democracy and more openness um so that's why we need to encourage participation interventions of the civil society um, should be held accountable obviously we need to support um and encourage um accountability and um, this is something that we aim at achieving as well now maybe we are going to receive some questions um, later on but let me also share an example or an experience that i experienced first and as you know in 89 uh, the berlin wall came down and um and the Eastern Bloc, the Socialist Bloc dissolved. And after that, right after that, these countries that dissolved in these countries, certain negative uh, pictures um, took place. International Mentally Disabled Association at the time regarding human rights violations, um, they, in Bulgaria, they went to a psychiatric hospital, and there were awful pictures that were reported by them, Dragas Vojvoda Psychiatric Hospital in Bulgaria, and Amnesty International, and many other international rights-based organizations and human rights organizations um, took, to, um, took, took the charge and called on the uh, Bulgarian government and held them accountable because the pictures were truly awful. It was like an internment camp, the psychiatric hospital. People were stark naked, drinking water off the ground. Awful, awful pictures indeed. And the government, quite interestingly, said the following. They said that they did not have the means, financial means, to build a better hospital. So um, the um, authority that needs to render this service is the government, the main, responsible party here is uh, the um, state. They are liable. They are truly responsible. And they need to be reminded of that, right? Like you said, but um, we see the same approach when we look at um, countries ridden with poverty, but we should not legitimize this uh, reaction. The main um, liable party needs to assume responsibility, and if it's the government, it's the government. If they're not even, even if they're not instigators of rights violations, they need to work to prevent such uh, rights violations because um, governments um, are very much capable of fi finding financing as well when it comes to these uh, issues. But of course, I'm sure th this is no more in, in in Bulgaria because they're now part of the EU. And I'm sure that they have uh, fixed many of these problems. But um, this is something that I remember very well. And, um, and the government said simply that they did not have the means. And this was their reaction. But today, as well, we see similar reactions in many parts of the world. And um, we see this happening time to time. And um, sadly, uh, we still experience similar reactions. But what we need to do is um, we need to remind public authorities of their responsibilities. Mehmet Bey says, You are our representatives, fulfilling your obligations. Uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. All right. So let me share that with you as well. Yes. 
Any questions at this point? Any additions? Any further comments? Yes, let me see. I don't think there are any further questions. So then let us adjourn our session. Just a few reminders. Granting Association, our colleagues at the association. First of all, a few reminders. First of all, let me thank you all for your participation. As we part this meeting today, um, also, can you please write the three top three things that will stay with you as you leave this conference? Grand Dink Association has created an assessment form uh, to help them with their future future um, events, and the link has been sent to you all in the chat box. So please fill out this form and share that with us. One last thing. And the next event will focus on maneuvering for civil society roles, responsibilities, and borders. So on the 7th of April at 6 p.m., this will be discussed um, and the association, the foundation um, is now sending you the links uh, for registry if you'd like to uh, join the session on the 7th of April. So I thank you all for your participation. Once again, uh, let's thank our participants and to you all and to the Harant Inc. Foundation for bringing us together, for making this event possible. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.